Okay, we're picking up with Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. This will be the first of five or perhaps six uh, approximately 15 minute videos. And we are picking up um, in the Half-Blood Prince, the chapter titled The Half-Blood Prince, and we are on about page uh, 180 or so in the American paperback version. And where we're picking up, Dumbledore has just sent Harry a message about his first private lesson with him. That's about on page 180 or so. And then they go to their first class with Professor Slughorn, their first potions class, and um, Slughorn has them make a potion, and Harry grabs a book out of the bookcase, since he no longer has a potion book, since he didn't think he'd be taking potions, and he makes the potion, and then he reads in the back of the book. He does very well. Slughorn gives him full marks, all that kind of thing. And he reads in the back of the book. This is about page um, 191 or so. This book is the property of the Half-Blood Prince. Okay. They don't know who that is. And then in chapter 10, Harry has his first lesson with Dumbledore. And chapter 10 is titled, The House of Gaunt. Okay. So Harry and Dumbledore begin talking. And Dumbledore says at about page 196, You've been wondering, I'm sure, what I have planned for you during these, uh, for want of a better word, lessons. And Harry nods and says, yes, sir. And so Dumbledore says, um, excuse me, Harry says to Dumbledore, you said at the end of last term you were going to tell me everything. He's implying that Dumbledore didn't tell him everything. And Dumbledore says, and so I did. I told you everything I know. From this point forth, we shall be leaving the firm foundation of fact and journeying together through the murky marshes of memory into thickets of wildest guesswork. In other words, what I told you at the end of the previous year, keep in mind that's the end of Order of the Phoenix, what I told you at the end of that year was what I know to be fact. Everything we're doing from this point on is guesswork. Harry says, but you think you're right. Naturally. But as I've already proven to you, I make mistakes like the next man. Which is something that we're going to see come up again in Book 7. Okay, so they keep talking. Harry wants to make sure that what they're going to be doing has something to do with the prophecy. Because he is still very concerned with the prophecy which said, neither can live while the other survives. And Harry interpreted that to mean, to mean therefore, either I must kill Voldemort or he must kill me. Dumbledore says, yes. So Dumbledore tells Harry, we're going to be taking a trip down memory lane. And he pulls a memory out of his mind and puts it in the pensive. And Harry wants to know where they're going, and Dumbledore tells him, we're going down a memory, not of mine, but of Bob Ogden, who used to work for the Ministry of Magic. And so they watch this memory where Bob Ogden goes to the House of Gaunt, and they witness everything that occurs there. I'm skipping several pages now. And we see Merope, and we see Morphin. Um, and we see Gaunt speak in Purseltongue, and Morphin speak in Purseltongue. And about page... 210 or so. Dumbledore takes Harry, brings Harry back out of the pensive, and Harry's first question, what happened to the girl in the cottage? He saw, noticed, that Merope was abused. Maybe not physically, but she was at least mentally abused. She was, <clears throat> excuse me, emotionally abused by her father and her brother. And Dumbledore says, oh, she survived. Dumbledore goes on and mentions Marvolo. Harry, Marvolo? 
That's right. Glad to see you're keeping up. Harry's heard the name Marvola before. Back in book two, when he sees Tom Riddle use his, Harry's wand, to write in the air, Tom uh, Riddle, Tom Marvola Riddle, and he swishes the letters around to become, I am Lord Voldemort. That old man was Voldemort's grandfather, Dumbledore says. And Harry says, so Merope was Voldemort's mother? Yes, it was. He goes on and talks about the Muggle Morphin attack. That was Voldemort's father? Yes, very good. So Harry asks, why wouldn't Tom Riddle stay in love with Merope? And Dumbledore says, don't you know some things? And Harry immediately thinks, you know, what about an Imperius curse? No, a love potion. They've just been talking about love potions in his potions class. So they keep talking about page 212 or so. And Harry says, Merope, she died, didn't she? Wasn't Voldemort brought up in an orphanage? Dumbledore says, yes, indeed. Harry says, but she did have his baby. Yes. Harry, what went wrong? Why did the love potion stop working? Harry assumes that because Tom Riddle no longer loved her, there must have been a problem with the potion. Dumbledore, okay, he's just guessing, but he says, I believe she made the choice, the choice to stop giving him the love potion. Okay. Harry doesn't really understand why she would do that. Dumbledore says he wanted her, excuse me, Dumbledore believes that Merope wanted Tom Riddle to be in love with her for who she was. Okay, but she was wrong. So Dumbledore says that's enough to do for tonight. And Harry is kind of scratching his head. So all this has something to do with the prophecy? Yes, it does. And I can tell Ron and Hermione everything. Yes, you may. Okay. Harry asks again about the ring. And Dumbledore says, uh, Harry says that, that ring. He sees the ring that Dumbledore had had on his finger when Dumbledore first came to number four Privet Drive. But now the ring is cracked and it's sitting on one of the tables. Harry says, uh, you were wearing that ring, so I was. Isn't it the same ring Marvolo got, showed Ogden? The very same. But how did you have it? Later, Harry, he says. Okay. So we go to chapter 11, Hermione's helping hen. And there's going to be quite a bit of things that we um, skip. But on about page 221 or 222, Harry, Ron, Hermione are kind of talking, and Ron says, well, nothing can happen to us here at Hogwarts, because Hogwarts is safe. After all, we've got Dumbledore. And Hermione says, I don't think we've got him all the time. Haven't you noticed? His seat's been empty as often as Hagrid's. In other words, Hermione has noticed that Dumbledore is going off somewhere during the day, during the meals. Okay. A little bit of foreshadowing there. So we're going to skip a bunch again. Um, and about page 233 or so. When the students all come, excuse me, they're talking about when the students arrived back at Hogwarts this year. Okay. And we're being told, again, about page 232. Um, let's see here. Hermione talks about how they were all searched when they arrived at Hogwarts. Harry says, were you? I wasn't. Oh, no, of course you weren't. I forgot. You were late. Well, Filch ran over all of us with secrecy sensors when we got into the entrance hall. Any dark object would have been found. Now that's kind of interesting. Bear in mind, why was Harry late? He snuck into Malfoy's cabin and spied on him, and Malfoy saw him. Malfoy, you know, petrifies him, stomps on his face. It's Tonks who rescues him, and Harry is brought up to the Great Hall 
by Snape. Why is it significant that Harry does not have the censor done around his body? Well, look at what Hermione says. Any dark object would have been found. What is a horcrux? It's a piece of dark magic. Would the horcrux have been found? That is, or maybe not would the horcrux have been found, but would Harry have set off some kind of alarm? It's an interesting question. So we come to the chapter, Silver and Opals, and about page 239-240. Let's see here. Harry has used the Levicorpus nonverbal spell on Ron, and then he lets Ron down. But before he does, we're told. He groped for the potion book, riffled through it in a panic, trying to find the right page. At last he located it and deciphered one cramped word underneath the spell. Praying that this was the counter jinx, Harry thought Libericorpus with all his might. That's kind of interesting. I don't know, it's just one little word. But never before have we had the word praying used throughout books one through five, or even through the first part of book seven, uh, excuse me, book six. But yet we're told it's Harry kind of going, please, please help me help you. Have we seen Harry pray before? Yes, in a sense. Back there in um, the Chamber of Secrets, he puts the hat on, help me, help me, please, someone help me. And the hat drops the sword of Godric Gryffindor down on his head. In, in fact, earlier Harry says that, help me, help me, Fox shows up bearing the sorting hat. Okay? So just an important, I think, little point. Let's see here. Let's skip a bunch more. We come to about page 244, 245. And they've arrived at Hogsmeade. And they get into Honey Dukes, and they're walking into the crowded shop, and this is the first time we see this phrase in the books. Ron says, thank God, shivered Ron as they were enveloped by warm, toffee-scented air. Let's stay here all afternoon. It's cold outside, they go inside, and Ron says, thank God. We've never heard that throughout books one through five. Okay. We're going to start hearing it again. We're going to hear it once or twice more in this book. And in book seven, we're going to hear, thank God, or some variant thereof, numerous times. It's at least six, and I think it's, it's actually more about ten or so. Okay. So they run in. They see Slughorn and stuff. Harry tries to hide. Harry sees Mundungus. He challenges Mundungus because he realizes Mundungus has been stealing things from him because he's been stealing things from uh, number 12, Grimmel Place. Okay. Um, Harry sees the thing with Leanne and Katie Bell. And Katie Bell touches the locket. Excuse me, not the locket, but the opal necklace, the silver and opal necklace. And Harry immediately tells McGonagall that he thinks Malfoy has something to do with it. Even though Hermione says Malfoy wasn't anywhere in Hogsmeade, it couldn't have been Malfoy, etc. And McGonagall says, well, without any hard evidence, we can't really do anything. Okay? So we'll stop the first lecture there and we'll pick up in, with chapter 13, The Secret Riddle.